So, Pradeep Kumar here. Uh, so, today's topic we are going to discuss on uh, Internet of Things and uh, Six Low Pan. So, this topic seems to be uh, a purely technical topic. So, maybe some of you have heard about what is Internet of Things, so what is going to uh, uh, dominate in the future, so these things. But uh, what really the implication says is how do we implement this? What are the challenges behind us? What are the techniques behind this uh, to implement such kind of technology in the future? So, here I am there for the next one hour to uh, help you in understanding how to really to implement this IoT uh, on a particular uh, device sensors, how to do that. So at the end of this slide I have some, uh, I have de deployed an application also, I will show you that also, as an emulation I will show you that. Uh, you have all your query, you just hold it, so uh, as well I have my website and my blog, which is given in, uh, in front of you, that is nsnam.com where I have all my lecture materials, everything is there. So let us go to the session now. Uh, the agenda for this uh, today's session will be uh, Internet of Things, this is an overview. So what is the open standard, uh, what IoT demands, and what are the design uh, operating system available for uh, this consigned devices, and uh, the comparisons, and uh, of course the six low pans. So what really it's a six low pan is all about. So the very first thing is, uh, what is meant by Internet of Things? So some of you have already heard about this, uh, it's well and good, but for those who have never heard about what is this IoT, so internet connected objects like RFIDs, so you can see that uh, in places like so many places we will be uh, seeing things, uh, let's say you take a fan, uh, you take a tube light in our home, so we take a refrigerator, uh, so let's say if elderly people are there in the home, so how do we uh, monitor their uh, health records in a day to day life. So for all these things uh, earlier we had some kind of sensors, but now we call those sensors up IoT devices. The main reason behind this is we can access these devices via the uh, internet protocol, so that we call as IP. That is IP version 4, IP version 6, like that, uh, this technology. So internet of things is all about the things, uh, what we see, what we feel, what we experience every day to day life will have a connectivity. And that connectivity will be reported to your gateway or reported to your base station wherein we can uh, do some processing analysis on blah, blah. So that's what all about IoT. So it mainly works with IP version 6 uh, rather than IP version 4 because uh, suppose you are from networking background, you might have heard about IP version 4, you know that uh, 192.168.0.1, 172.16.1.41, uh, so something like that, you might be heard about this IP version 4. The problem with IP version 4 is it's almost over. So uh, the world cannot able to provide this IP version 4 addressing to uh, the people hereafter because it's almost full. So we have to go for a next level of uh, protocol called as Internet Protocol version 6. So this uh, version 6 protocol have 128 bits of uh, information. So it can able to address more than a billions of devices. So uh, as per the calculation, uh, in the next 10 years or uh, in 2025 or so, uh, there will be 50 billion devices across the globe will be powered using this IP version 6. So that is a power of this Internet of Things. So we are going to see how this IP version 6 is really uh, helping in uh, deploying this Internet of Things applications. And uh, powered, uh, this IoT things is mainly powered by sensor nodes. We simply call as MOT. So M-O-T-E, yes, that have given brackets, uh, which are low cost, small size, and power efficient. So they are all uh, running with a small battery, uh, which have limited memory, like uh, random access memory and read-only memory. But all these things uh, provides a real-time guarantee. So that means if you want to measure something, if you want to uh, measure something or if you want to analyze something, uh, you will not have to wait for a long time. Though it has a limited power, limited memory and limited size, the guarantee will be in real time. So if I want to check a blood pressure of a patient which is at a remote location from my place, I can get his blood pressure within a uh, period of, let's say, uh, two or three seconds. So, within, uh, so that kind of guarantee this IoT has to give. And uh, this is what a very important uh, slide for this day, uh, this open standard of IoT. So this open standard, you can see left hand side, I have uh, six layers, in the right hand side I have six layers. This left hand side layer is completely what we have been doing for the past 40 years in the networking domain. The right hand side, what we are going to see will be mainly for the Internet of Things. So you can see that uh, in the bottom most layer, I will come from bottom to top rather than top to bottom. So in the bottom we can see that IEEE 802.3 on the left hand side and IEEE 802.11 on the left hand side. 
So this 802.3 is nothing but the Ethernet. So what we use the wired Ethernet in all of our offices, corporate uh, places where we use wired, wired Ethernet. And 802.11 is nothing but the Wi-Fi. So what we every day we are using 802 Ethernet and the Wi-Fi has been there for the past 40 years in the bottommost layer. Above that, uh, the data link layer, there is a Mac, medium access control. So how this medium is given to uh, other users, that's what. And above that, we have IPv4, IPv6. Above that, we have routing protocols, then TCP, UDP, transport protocols, and finally, we have HTTP, FTP, that's application protocol. So this have been, we have been doing this uh, for more than four decades. But coming to the right-hand side, this is what uh, we need now. Uh, in the bottommost layer, we call it as Zigbee. Uh, I, I don't know whether you heard about it or not. So it's called a Zigbee, E Z I G P W E. So Zigbee uh, networks. So we have a physical layer that is the Zigbee uh, antenna, Zigbee tower, Zigbee transmitter, transceiver. Everything will be there in uh, real hardware. Rather than Ethernet, we have Zigbee. It is also a kind of wireless protocol. Above that, we have a medium access control of Zigbee again. So again, we have 802.15.4. And uh, above that, we have six low pan. So so the topic for the day is 6 low pan. So 6 low pan is mainly <coughs> categorized this way. Uh, 6 is for IPv6, <coughs> LO for low power, W pan for wireless personal area networks. So why this 6 low pan is uh, there in, in the market, I'll just tell you. Uh, above that we have IPv6 and RPL. So IPv6 is above and uh, above that we have UDP or ICMP and finally we have COAP, Constraint Application Protocol. So this is what we are going to experience uh, in the next 20-25 years. So that's what we call IoT. Uh, so uh, you can see the 6 low pan here uh, in the, from the bottom is a third location, 6 low pan. Uh, I just uh, give an analogy here. Uh, for example, there's a huge dam, huge dam, a dam which uh, uh, there's a rain and uh, there is a, a full amount of water in the dam and the dam is getting opened and there is a small outlet at the dam uh, uh, to make the water to flow from the dam to the for irrigation. Let's say the dam is getting opened for the irrigation. So instead of opening the dam uh, to the full, uh, they are opening a dam only with the outlet of a small pipe. So what happens is heavy amount of water flowing through a small pipe. This, uh, this is an analogy. analogy heavy amount of water flows through a small pipe. What really happens is that water cannot hold within that pipe and obviously uh, you will feel that the water will get overflow or the corresponding water cannot be went for irrigation and the dam might even collapse. The same thing happened here. IP version 6, the payload, that is a maximum transfer unit we call MTU. It is around 1200 bytes, approximately I am telling 1280 bytes. That is what the maximum payload and IP version 6 can carry. But the Zigbee 802.15.4, it can carry only 127 bytes. Please see that it's almost 10 times bigger than this, uh, the physical layer. Physical layer, nothing but uh, the hardware layer. So usually the hardware is uh, there to carry the entire uh, network bytes. So the IP version 6, such a very big uh, protocol, cannot fit into a smallest data layer or the physical layer. So for that, we need to have an adaptation layer. Somebody in between compress the packet from the IPv6 and send it to the uh, Zigbee. So that's why we call this 6 low pan as an adaptation layer. So recently, these nowadays, all the devices of IoT designed for IoT, they support this IPv6 as well they support 6 low pan. So one good example I'm telling you, there is a, a board, you would have heard about Raspberry Pi, uh, you would have heard about Arduino. So Arduino by default, it doesn't have a support of 6 low pan. So that means Arduino can able to do a simple embedded system kind of operations rather than a perfect IoT application because it doesn't support IPv6. For IPv6, we need to have a separate patch card. And for uh, 6 low pan, we need to have a separate uh, patch card. So only then, then we can say that Arduino is able to support an IoT application. But these two things are being supported by some of the sensor nodes. Some of the sensor nodes are modes we call. And uh, those are the applications, those are the hardware platform wherein we can uh, really think about a perfect IoT application. Okay, so uh, this slide is very important uh, in uh, for uh, the open standard of Internet of Things. And what IoT demands? So IoT demands, so there are, I have given some uh, five points here. Uh, what IoT demands is slow power, low cost, and low memory footprint. So uh, we have some sensors, so for example I use a sensor which 
have a memory of just 12 kilobytes 12 kilobytes of rom read only memory and 256 bytes of ram but still it does a perfect uh, thing of uh, accessing the vibration so i can read, i can sense the vibrations in the buildings i can sense the vibrations on a uh, floor i can even i can sense the seismic vibration when there is an earthquake he can able to predict it but a very limited memory, very limited processor, very limited power, limited battery, everything is limited. This is what IoT demands. So uh, a yeah, miniature device that can able to uh, help you out in uh, taking a perfect decision. Second thing is, should have provision for IPv6 with the 6 low pan adaptation layer. As we see in the previous uh, thing, uh, your sensor device or your uh, mode should have the provision for IPv6 and 6 low pan. So that means uh, IPv6 means uh, the payload should be thousand more than thousand bytes it has to send at a time. So such kind of provision should be there in the adaptation along with the adaptation layer. And you need to have a routing protocol. So nowadays routing protocol, see for example, uh, some of your most of you are from corporates. So your corporate will have a firewall, and you will have your uh, uh, devices like your laptops, your uh, machines. So your machines access internet. It goes via the firewall. So the firewall. Uh, will in turn talk to the nearest uh, mobile sub provider, uh, ISP we call. From the ISP it goes to the national backbone. So via this, usually they follow a protocol called as OSPF. That is open shortest path first. So whenever there is something wrong happens, automatically the routing takes the other shortest path. But for IoT, this could not be the case. We need to have a separate routing protocol because SPF, OSPF need more memory, more bandwidth and everything should be very huge. Which we can we cannot able to provide for an IoT because the device can able to handle only limited data. So we need to have a separate routing protocol for this. So for that there is a protocol called as RPL, routing protocol for uh, lossy networks. So that's what uh, we mean for IoT. And a new lightweight application layer protocol like unlike HTTP but should have a support for HTTP also. Uh, see for example uh, now the main purpose is so I am sitting in uh, in my office now. Uh, now in my home I have an air condition that air condition need to be switched on before I uh, leave my home before I leave my office and get in my home so what do I do is I have an IP address of my uh, device so I just from my browser I open my browser I type http colon slash slash uh, IP address dot uh, Pradeep Kumar dot com something like that when I put it and press enter in front of me I have my air condition on or off a button will be there simply what it is I put the button on so once I press it on, automatically my air conditioning gets on. So this is I call IP version. This is I call I, uh, HTTP access. So but this HTTP have huge headers. So for example, it can we ask what kind of browser you have, whether you are using JavaScript, whether you use Flash, uh, the asynchronous JavaScript. Everything this HTTP has. But for IoT, such things doesn't matter at all. So these things need not be there in this HTTP. So we have to have a other uh, application layer wherein it support the similar procedure of HTTP but should also have the support for HTTP. So we have a protocol called as COAP. We call COAP, C-O-A-P, Constrained Application Protocol. It is a lightweight HTTP protocol wherein you will not have all the headers available for a HTTP protocol. And finally we have header compression for IPv6 against uh, IEEE 802.15 on 5.4 Mac. So that means we have a Zigbee Mac uh, that can be compressed when the IPv6 packet is coming to its discretion. So this is what an IoT demand. So if suppose these things are there, uh, are not there, then shall I not call that as IoT? No, it's not the case. So IoT means that in future, if you want to have everything on an IP based, then I should go for such kind of provision on a intellectual uh, Internet of Things applications. <coughs> Now 6 low pan. So this is what we have about. So 6 low pan again I remind you. Uh, 6 is for IPv6, 6, LO for low power and W pan for wireless personal area networks. It has a characteristic like it has a small packet size. Again 6 low pan deals with packet size very small. Bandwidth is 20, 40 or 250 kilobits per second. So nowadays we are using a, a internet of 100 Mbps, uh, 50 Mbps, 200 Mbps of internet connectivity. But it works with the maximum bandwidth of 250 kilobits per second. Like we say, the earlier uh, uh, broadband connection where we have in our country was 256 kilobits per second. So this is what the maximum speed this 6 low pan can work. And it used star and mesh topology. So if one of the link broken, the entire uh, network goes down. 
or if one link is broken, still the network can survive. So that kind of topology we need to have. And mostly they are all battery operated. So you have to throw the sensors or you have to put the sensors in the place with the battery being operated. The battery could last for a month, last for a week or sometimes it can last for a year also. So in that case we have to design our protocol accordingly that it has to last for an year. And low cost. So obviously uh, low cost. So, uh, so for example if I want to monitor uh, water harvesting in a, in, a, in, a, in a very big corporate network, I want to have water, rain water harvesting. So wherever the great amount of rain is there inside the campus, I want to have a harvesting. So I need to have at least 200 sensors. So if one sensor costing me 5,000 rupees, then 200 into 5,000 something around 10 lakh it comes. Uh, but nowadays if you go for 200 sensors, even I can get a one sensor of uh, 500 rupees. So just within a lakh, I can able to deploy a very bigger application to it. So that's what we mean say low cost. And ad hoc networks and device has limited accessibility. So you cannot do whatever the device want. You cannot do anything the device can able to do. The device have some set of operations only that only those things that the device can do. You cannot expect the device to do everything because it is a embedded uh, device. So it can do only a set of operations or a particular operation. And it is unreliable because of the wireless medium. So you cannot say that at what time the wireless can fail because it is a wireless medium. So the quality of service is very limited. So we cannot rely on it. So this is what the six low pan say. And here uh, what I was uh, telling you earlier, no method exists to make an IP run over IEEE 802.15.4 networks because the maximum transfer unit is 1280 bytes wherein uh, the Zigbee is 127 bytes. So we cannot fit such a bigger thing into a smaller thing. So that's why the need of six low pan arises. So and not all ad hoc routing protocol may be immediately suitable for low pan. So there are some uh, protocols. So for example, uh, you are using a Wi-Fi network on your campus, even your phone, when your office gives you a Wi-Fi. So you have a router, you have access points. So when your phone detects your access point and the access point goes to a particular network, it detects another access point. So something like that it goes, it works on a protocol. So the protocol could be AODV or it could be DSR, a dynamic source routing or on-demand distance vector protocol, some kind of protocols. These protocols again, uh, they are all data hungry or memory hungry. That means they need more data, they need more memory for handling it. So such protocols may not be suiting for the IoT. So we need to go for a separate protocol. And security for multi-hops needs to be considered. Uh, I hope you would have uh, seen a video uh, recently, uh, uh, last week, uh, what could be the outcome of IoT. What happens is uh, there was there is a company they were in, they have all the uh, lighting system in the, com in the company, they have deployed the lighting system through IoT. That means the entire uh, floor is being uh, connected with the lights, so many lights and the entire thing is connected at a, a given gateway. So everything is powered by IoT. What happens is a drone flying above the I mean above the top floor the drone is flying. The drone simply hacks the network and the entire floor gets dark. That means the entire lights get, are getting switched off. That means somebody from externally they can control your devices. They, are, they can control your lights. They can control your sensing. Everything they can able to take over the control. So we need to have a security is a very greatest challenge in this uh, internet of things. As of now people are still working on the security because security it's a flaw now. As of now, it's a flaw. Uh, it's not uh, matured protocols and matured things have not yet come. So it's a still it's the need for the day. And this is what the challenges of uh, I have given in a simple slide of uh, what are the challenges. In the left hand side below the red color, you can see the impact here. So if you want to have low power, there is a battery can withstand for uh, more than one to two years of lifetime. Suppose for example, uh, another example I'm here to tell you about. So we have tried this also. Uh, so what we did is uh, in the Chennai, uh, I stay in Chennai, so in Chennai there is a highway nearby. So in the highway we want to find the vibrations the vehicle emits. Vibration means uh, when a two wheeler passes on the road, what happens to the vibration? When a car uh, passes on the road, what happens to the vibration? When a, a heavy moving vehicle like bus, uh, lorries, vans, what happens? And when the truck like heavy vehicles, uh, they carry containers what happens to the vibration. So we have a plan to take vibrations uh, for using every two seconds uh, we have recorded the data. Every two seconds means every two seconds there was a mesh formation we recorded we sense the vibration of devices. Uh, so what happens is the battery just came just two days only. That's around 40 hours the battery came. 
so it's a two aa battery is like you uh, use it in our uh, uh, remote in the remote control of your television or so so you will be using two aa batteries the same aa battery we were using for the sensors it just came for 40 hours after 40 hours it's gone away then what we did is we did another experimentation saying that uh, we want to improvise the battery life so what we did is the mesh form is instead of two seconds we make it to three minutes that means every three minutes the sensor records the data but we have put two sensors across the road that means one sensor will do 1.5 second other sensor will do the third second so that means every 1.5 uh, minute you will get the every 90 seconds you get the data that we have tried so the battery lasts around a month but it is an approximation we have run the again the thing for one week but one week the battery was safe it was still working fine 40 percentage was remaining so but if you want to have it for one to two years lifetime for the batteries then you need to think about it what kind of storage you should have what kind of routing you should have what kind of security you should have and how to manage the entire network that thing and next thing is i want to have a low cost that's only ten dollars less than ten dollars per unit just 600 700 rupees per device so again you have a challenge so what kind of address generation so how routing can be changed and low bandwidth so bandwidth again how can you limit uh, if the bandwidth is very limited how, what do you do with the device how do you play around the device and high density so that means uh, per square feet let's, let's say a field a paddy field or agricultural field i want to uh, have pump in water for the agriculture unit so uh, uh, let's say for example the farmer need not be there all the time whenever the fields need water they have to pump in the water automatically through the sensors if i want to do the let's say i have a thousand square feet of land or say, let's say 5000 square feet of land for the 5000 square feet of land for every square feet i need to have one unit of sensor so that that corresponding square feet can be benefited uh, by the flow of water so for this i need to deploy more for a field so for all these things the final thing is ip network interaction that means the my my prime thing aim is to uh, make the ip ip to work that means i need to use my internet protocol to work so uh, this what uh, this challenges for this six low pan so six low pan uh, uh, though most of the security most of the sensor devices doesn't support as of now there are only limited set of devices they are supporting and even these devices have these challenges this impact so you can go for low power you can go for low cost you can go for low bandwidth suppose in the left hand side there are five things i have if you want to have all the five things on a single node then think about the cost of the device so there are two modes like sky mode and wish mode so though they are very old but uh, in india they are very rare uh, to procure the, those sensor modes but they cost around uh, 12000 rupees i had I understand that it is around 12,000 rupees. We want to have all the five: low power, low cost, low bandwidth, high density, and it has IP network interaction. And here comes uh, the Zigbee. So I didn't use the name Zigbee because uh, Zigbee is a commercial name, but uh, it's rather technical. So I use the number like 802.15.4, so that at the end of the session, this will be there in your mind. So what is 802.15.4? That's the purpose. That I didn't use Zigbee, but whenever you see Zigbee, please uh, replace this with 802.15.4. Both are same. So Zigbee have just 128 bytes, including the Mac, and 103 bytes of payload. So you can able to carry a maximum of 100 bytes only. Just think about 100 bytes. If you are from a, a C++ C background, it can store just 25 integer variables. That's what I can say about. So just as a simple uh, Mac here. But it uses 64-bit Mac, but have provision for 16-bit also. Uh, support for multiple topologies like star, mesh, these kind of topologies. And data rates, again, the maximum is 250 kilobits per second. And range between 10 to 30 meters. Please understand, this is what uh, uh, we need now. Because 10 to 30 meters, 30 meters is a very smallest distance wherein you can able to do. So even your Bluetooth can work nowadays up to 100 meters. Now there are technology come that you can work up to 100 meters. But Zigbee, the maximum thing is 30 meters. So within 30 meters, you have to place another Zigbee device. Only then both can have a multi-hop connection or both, both can interact. If you place 50 meters apart from another device, both of them might not have the interaction. So that's what happened in this 802.15.4. And why IP version 6? So this is what the challenge. So most of you might be uh, throwing a question on why we need IP version 6. The advantage is being, it is more suitable for higher density. 
and statelessness mandated. So that means uh, you need not bother about the protocols, uh, packets and other things. No network address translation. As of now, the NAT is not necessary, but in uh, IPv4 we use NAT now. And possibility of adding innovative techniques such as location and other addressing. Suppose I want to locate a particular device. So let's say uh, one another example I, I just thought of giving you now here. So let's say for example you want to uh, find out the fish cultivation in the ocean. Let's say you take Indian Ocean. Uh, usually every year 45 days the fishermen uh, they don't go for hunting fish. They don't go because uh, it's the time for their breeding. So uh, for example we want to do a work on it. So what we do is we take sensors and IoT devices. We go to the ocean on a particular location, throw the sensors on the on the sea or the ocean, throw the sensors, simply throw it and you be there in the boat or in the ship wherever there is an access, that's a gateway. That is what your sensor will be reporting to the gateway, that's the nearest gateway. So you be there uh, for a period of let's say 4 hours or 5 hours, get the information and uh, you want to find out on which area the fish cultivation is more. So that the next time when the fishermen go, you can tell them the location. That if you go to this location, you get more fish. This is the simple thing. So in that case, IPv6 have an advantage of it tells its location. So you can able to predict the location of the device. Because once you throw the device, you cannot take, take back the device. But the device will give its location. I am here. This is my place. I am here like that. IPv4 also will do, but nowadays IPv4 is uh, very rarely used. But the main problem with uh, IPv6 is larger address width, just 128 bits of information, so it's very larger. And complying to IPv6 node requirements, so you need to have a mandatory IP security. But security is good, but security again gives overhead. So that's the problem with IPv6. Uh, now uh, this is the topic because why I am showing you operating system that supports XLOPAN. So uh, this is the implementation part actually. I will be telling you what are the operating systems available for this 6 uh, Sabha, uh, this is a place I want a questionnaire here. Uh, can you please run a poll? Oh, thank you. Okay, so 56 percent of you have uh, told that you know about NUIS. Around 16 percent is knows about Contiki and 21 percent is about RIOT and 7 percent is heard all, all of this. Fine. So uh, these are the three operating system uh, currently supported uh, for 6 Lopan. Now these are the three operating systems now mainly this IOT is being supporting now. Uh, TinyOS, Contiki operating system and RIOT. So TinyOS uh, in, in brackets I have put that it, no support available as on date, no support for the latest uh, devices and Contiki OS is so popular now and RIOT is upcoming and becoming popular. And uh, so many of the western countries they work on IOT so they work on either of these two operating system either it could be Contiki operating system or it could be RIOT operating system. So these are the two operating system in uh, market now and Contiki OS since most of you are from corporates uh, this Contiki uh, is a similar support from Eclipse. So the look and feel everything will be looking similar like Eclipse. But RIOT is completely on the white and black that is completely on the terminal mode. So unless you are very good in terminal you cannot handle these devices. But Contiki operating system uh, it's powerful as of now. And uh, this tiny OS, anyway, uh, since most of you heard about this tiny OS, I just uh, tell you what is this all about. It's a monolithic kernel, uses a programming language called as NEST, that is Network Embedded System C Programming. So it's some kind of uh, similar kind of C programming, but not exactly looking like C. It's something like uh, in English syntax. Uh, it provides algorithms, protocols, drivers, file systems, and uh, kernel. So everything it supports. But the main problem is it stopped its support and it is not extensively maintained. 
sustained. So actually, uh, I understand that it was supported till 2005. And after 2005, nothing has been progressing in this except uh, one or two researchers, uh, they, they do on their own. So that means almost for the past 10 years, it, they doesn't have a support. So no need of using this. And Kantiki, it is one of the layered architecture. So since it is layered architecture, it is very powerful and uses C and C++ partial support. So you can use either a C or C++ programming language. It also provides drivers, communication and sensor data handling as services. So like you see a platform as a service like that, you can have a sensor as a service, that kind of mode it supports. It uh, again supports the IP stack, that is micro IP stack, uh, device driver and the product rating system. So uh, if you are in purely technical, maybe I'll give a simple thing. Uh, See, uh, we have we have been telling about multi-threading. So multi-threading means uh, a, a task is running, it have 100 threads, for example. Each and every thread will have a, a stack space. So that means its own private memory it will have, private space it will have. But product threading, this, because of the private space, what happens is if you have more threads, it will lead to uh, memory occupation of more memory occupation and more processing power it needs. So obviously, your processing power will not be able to satisfy the entire requirement. So that's why they have a proto-threading mechanism. There is, it is like a stackless implementation, no stack. That's what this proto-threading means. And in Contiki, there's an advantage is code replacement during runtime. So for example, uh, I'll tell you one, one good example. So you are sitting uh, with all the developmental libraries in your machine, and the sensor is just placed uh, 50 meters away from your uh, your machine, your machine have a gateway that is connected to the internet and your machine is having a direct access with the sensor. Now you want to change the code on the sensor device which you cannot be able to lift with your hand. So that means you need a ladder to climb and pick the sensor but you can do the programming from your place. Simply you can just write the programming over the OTA, we call OTA. So over the programming you can able to do. So that kind of uh, facility is there in Contiki operating system. But main issue in Contiki is you have to download the entire OS into the sensor device. So that means like your laptop, like your machine, you have a Windows, Linux, or Mac operating system. So likewise, your sensor device will have an OS. That OS is nothing but this Contiki or React, RIOT or this tiny OS. You have to download the entire OS into it. Now the third OS is it's very powerful. So I prefer this RIOT OS. It's very powerful because it's on white and black. That's why I said that it is on a terminal based. So it uses micro kernel approach, so the memory limitation and the processing is very limited. It supports even down to their memory, even if you have one kilobytes of memory, this OS supports. So it is a tickless scheduler. Tickless scheduler means whenever it is idle, it go to sleep mode. So that means it never stay, it never stay full. You never there is something idleness, it goes to the idle mode. And design in such a way that kernel functions are scheduled under the low clock speed. So low clock speed, maybe in your uh, machine you would have in your uh, desktop machines, you can run under high clock, low clock, like that. But this OS is completely scheduled, these functions are scheduled on a low clock speed. And full support of C, C++, and POSIX also ensued, so that means you can port the code. So if you write a code on RIOT, later if you want to change the entire code to some other operating system coming in future, I can able to do that, if it is POSIX enabled. So this OS have a POSIX support also. And full support of RPL, 6 low pan, IPv6, TCP, UDP, it's complete support is there in RIOT and the main advantage is it's still been maintained every one month they release a bug, they release a patch. So if you want to, suppose if you feel that I want to deploy an IOT application or IOT system using this OS and I suggest you to go through RIOT OS. And here a few hundred bytes of RAM and ROM is enough to load the OS into the modes. Uh, support multi-threading and real-time through POSIX. Zero latency interrupt handler. Zero latency, we can say that it's a zero watts uh, lamp, we can say. But does it consume only zero watts? No. <coughs> a limited power has been consumed. Uh, similarly here, a zero latency means almost equal to zero. That kind of latency will have. So that means whenever you need a device, whenever the sensor needs a device, within no time the device will be allocated to the sensors. So that means that such kind of uh, latency, it has zero, low, no latency at all and minimum context switching time. Context switching means uh, switching from one process to another process. Even your desktop OS will have a higher context switching time, but this kind of uh, devices will have very lower context switching time. The kernel will never crash because of the error prone device drivers. So they design the kernel in such a way that it is never getting crashed. So that is the advantage of this RIOT operating system.
and here is a small comparison I have given uh, in these two slides. So in the left hand side you can see availability. So for what are the maybe after since it has been recorded and put it there so you can uh, download this thing at the later stage. Uh, what kind of sensor the tiny voice is support. So Mica family, Atmega, Telos B, uh, this whole. And Contiki, uh, the advantage is Contiki supports the older as well as the newer. Uh, this Contiki was there for the past 6-7 uh, years before this word IoT have been framed. The Contiki was there. So they call the constrained operating system. That means the operating system for constrained devices. That's what they call. But since IoT now it is a jargon, it's a jargon of the century. So they in turn support the new devices also. So they also release the new patches. Every four months, five months, they release a new operating system, new version of the OS. And RIOT, for all the new sensors, they have a support. And support is, uh, tiny OS is completely stuck. So maybe we can stop talking about tiny operating operating system. So in Contiki, we have a, a full support, actively maintained, and RIOT also. And simulator, uh, in Contiki and RIOT, we have a native emulation. So native emulation means, so this is what I'll, uh, this is very catchy thing. Suppose, for example, I want to do an application. Uh, I don't have sensors. Let's say I, I import sensors. It takes another month to come. Another month uh, come, uh, it takes time to reach me. So within the one month, what can I do? So in uh, corporates, you can say proof of concept, POCs. The same kind of POC you can able to do on Contiki OS. You can think that the, this is a device that I'm going to do the programming. So you can able to see that, you can able to see the packet capture, you can able to analyze this uh, structure, you can able to compute the power, occupation, energy energy consumption, whatever you can do on a real sensor, everything you can able to do on a Contiki operating system. So that's why the native emulation is available on this Contiki OS. Maybe at the end of the slide I will give you, uh, there are two, three applications I have uh, hosted in my YouTube channel. You can go through that and then you can deploy those applications on your own machine also. The Contiki have uh, that emulation. And the RAM ROM, you can see that uh, in RIOT, you can see that the RAM is just 1.5 kilobytes and the ROM is 5 kilobytes. That is enough. I mean, this is a minimal requirement what an RIOT device have. So that means if you have 1.5 kilobytes of RAM, that is enough for you to deploy an entire application within that node. So that means the OS will be sitting in the memory. Along with that, your application code will be sitting in the inside the memory within just 5 kilobytes of ROM and 1.5 kilo, 1 kilobytes of RAM. So such is the power of RIOT. Because RIOT uses only in black and white. But in Contiki OS, it needs some more packages to be installed. So they have claimed that 2 kilobytes and 30 kilobytes. So they need to have minimum of 30 kilobytes of space uh, in ROM, read-only memory, so that we can download the entire OS into the um, sensor nodes. Multi-threading, RIOT supports multi-threading, but Contiki supports proto-threads and modularity. So modularity mainly it deals with RIOT. So RIOT is completely modular, but whereas Contiki OS they have a partial modular support, but they are working on the mod modularity. So very soon you can able to get the modular support for Contiki. And uh, here is the comparison, and uh, this comparison uh, uh, I don't find out the, uh, where I have taken this, but this seems to be a overall view of the four operating systems. So I included Linux also there. Because earlier for sensor devices, Linux was the OS being used uh, like RT Linux. Now we call Wind River Linux, the embedded Linux platform. Uh, so minimum RAM you can see that among all the RIOT have the minimum RAM requirement. Similarly the minimum ROM, RIOT have the lowest to ROM requirement. And C support, so RIOT have the complete support. Whereas Contiki have a partial support of C. C++ support, Again, it, uh, Contiki have a minimal support, but uh, seems like it's not completely supporting. Some libraries of C++ have been supported in uh, Contiki. Multi-threading, again. So you can see that the RIOT have a complete power over uh, the other operating systems. So just check it here. Everything is perfect in RIOT. But Linux, again, the modularity and real-time, it doesn't give the real-time guarantee, whereas that also been uh, happening in RIOT. Okay, so this what about this uh, operating system for six low pan. So if you are planning, so um, if you are uh, since you are uh, attending this session, hoping that you can do some, uh, you can deploy some applications. So whatever I'm telling you here is uh, the entire application you can able to do by just downloading a operating system instant Contiki from the website Contiki, and uh, 
you need to have uh, Oracle virtual box. So that is a VM machine. Or if you are uh, very good in uh, handling Linux, so you can download the entire Contiki OS onto your Linux platform and you can work on it. It's up to you. And um, if you have these two things, you can able to deploy applications. So, so most of the modules like Sixlopan, RPL, COAP, that's co-app, constraint application protocol, everything is already been programmed and those these programs are already available as modules in uh, this Contiki. So your job is to just select the sensor, uh, compile the code, and download the code into the sensor and run the sensors. So that's what you can able to do. So within no time, within the next two hours, if you have the OS and something ready, uh, you can deploy an application. So the thing is over now. So now a demo on co-app protocol in Contiki OS. So co-app and six low pan, that's what I mean. So what is a make co-app? So it's a CO for constraint. So constraint means uh, the device have some constraints. Based on these constraints, uh, we have how can we access this device? That's what this constraint uh, application protocol, AP for application protocol. It is similar like HTTP. So most of you will be using HTTP colon slash slash www.nsnam.com, google.com like that we'll be using. Or else we'll be using an IP address like 27.100.200.135, something like that IP address we can use. Instead of HTTP, I can use core. So instead of HTTP colon slash slash, I can use co-app colon slash slash, C-O-A-P colon slash slash, as simple as that. So HTTP and co-app both are same in operation, but co-app will have very limited headers. It's a very lightweight limited headers, whereas HTTP have huge headers, heavy weight. So we don't need such a huge uh, protocol for the simpler devices. We need simpler things. So nowadays we can say HTTP. Yes, that is secure HTTP, HTTP over SSL, secure sockets layer protocol. So most of the Google applications we have HTTPS. Similarly, co-op also come with co-ops, C-O-A-P-S, consigned application protocol with secure socket layer. So that your data will be secure. Nobody can able to decrypt your data during uh, transfer. So what do I do is, in context wise, uh, I cannot show a video here directly. So I will give the link for the video, you can go and see it there. But I have taken the screenshots of the video what I have taken. So today morning I tried this. Uh, so prerequisites what you need. So co-op uh, will not work directly on a browser. Uh, so so far uh, Firefox have a support for co-op. So the Firefox browser has a plugin called as copper, CU. So it's a metal, CU, the copper metal word that's a, in the chemical chart it is there. So copper plugin. And the prefer sky modes or wish modes for running border router. I'll tell you what's a border router. So usually the sensors will report to the gateways. So for example, one, one application is uh, in your house, uh, let's say for example, 800 square feet house. So you have deployed some 10 sensors across your house, in the door, uh, in the CCD camera, in the air conditioning, in the refrigerator, in the stove, and uh, in the washroom. So everywhere you deploy sensors. And all these sensors, they can talk to each other because the range is 30 meters maximum, so they can talk to each other. But how do they contact the internet? So I need to uh, transfer the data in the internet. So how do they contact? We need to have a router. So via that router, all the data will be transferred to the internet. Or you are going to access all the eight devices, all the eight sensors from your uh, working place. You want to monitor it. So you need to have internet connectivity. So for that, we need to have a border router. So border router is a place where all the sensor will be reporting the data to the border router. That's what I have it. And you need to have the GCC compiler for MSP. So why have you given a prerequisite is if some of you are trying this, you may be uh, needing this software to be ready. And here, uh, this is the first session and this is the first uh, screenshot. You can see that there are uh, three nodes, <coughs> one node in green color and other two in orange color. So the green node, is nothing but the border border router. So these two nodes, so one, two, three, they are in a straight line. So one and three, they do not have a coverage. You can see that the green color uh, concentric circle have the coverage. Two and three are in range, whereas one and three are not in range. So the green color is the transmission range. Uh, gray color uh, circle is the interference range. So there are two ranges there. But the other interference will be there, but no transmission. So the node 1 cannot access 3. But what do they do is, in sensor or in IoT, what happens is, they form a multi-hop network. So the node 2 will help in fetching the data from 3 and give it to 1. 
So this is what the beauty of the sensor networks. So this is the first thing I have done it. So you can see that below the there is an address. A A A A colon colon two one two colon seven four zero one colon one colon one not one. So that is nothing but the IP version six. So don't think that I have he have used a smaller IP version six. There is a double colon is there in the after A A A A. So double colon indicates in between if you have zeros, you need not put the zeros directly. Instead of put the zeros, you can put a double colon there. So that it assumes that between these two columns there are mainly zeros. So that's what the uh, thing about this. And here, this is the example they have done it in Contiki operating system. We have a framework called the Kuja framework, C O O J A Kuja framework. And here, this is the border router I am running. So the router should be ready to accept packets. So there is a small uh, command we have to run it for running the border router. And this is the border router. You can see in the bottom we have two addresses: server IP version six addresses. So what is the server IP? One thing is A A A A like that. Another thing is FPG80. So you know that the local host now 127.0.0.1. The same way here, AAA is the actual address. FE80 is the local host address. That's what it means. So the IPv6 address, we are running the router. And here, this is the co-op. So you can see that in the address bar. So since this is an image, I could not able to show you, but you can check in the address bar. Uh, COAP colon slash slash. Then a square bracket. Then A A A A colon colon two one two. So I access the second node. So second node means in the previous line you can see this node, the second node. The address is ending at two not two. The same thing I am doing it here. So double A double A colon colon two one two seven four zero two colon two colon two not two. So only when you have a copper plugin installed on Firefox browser, this window will appear. If you do not have copper plugin, then Firefox doesn't know that what is called. It doesn't understand what is a protocol call. So that is a main. In the left-hand side, you can see in the red color, you can see that uh, actuators, sensors. So how many uh, sensors are there? How many actuators are there in the device? See, one one example about this uh, we have tried also. One example we have tried with our students. <clears throat> what we did is uh, we want to monitor the beat heartbeat of a particular person. Now you have uh, wearables like smartwatches, gadgets. Smart watches. What do they do? Is you just uh, wear it in your uh, left hand or right hand. In the right hand, the sensor will be just pointing towards the heartbeat where you can able to uh, read the pulse at that location. So what happens is every time your watch will record the heartbeat. The same way what we have done is uh, something like a, a five rupee coin. Earlier five rupee coin is very bigger in size. Something like the sensor we placed on the hand, and using this quad protocol, we access the heartbeat of the user. So what we do here is. In the next slide, I will just show you that. Uh, see, uh, in the outgoing, you can see that in the middle of this window, there is an outgoing. I have given number one here. Maybe I'll just show you here. So you can see this here. This number one here. So this number one indicates I am going to send a value one for my uh, device uh, toggle sensor. I am going to toggle the LED by sending a value one. You can see in the next slide, the LED indicates. So that means the red LED is getting on. So this is on the uh, sensor number two. There is a node number two. I want to make the LED on. So assuming that the sensor is deployed in a different place, and you are accessing via the power protocol from a different location, and you can have a control over it. So once you on it, the LED will be on at your location. So this way, I can able to do the programming. So if you are have a beat sensor, heartbeat sensor, HR sensor, heart rate sensor, then if you make on, so then you send a value one. That means high signal if you send it. The heart rate will be computed and read the value. So, what is the heart rate? So that you can able to do on a co-op on the six slope app. So that's all uh, about this application. Maybe I'll just uh, give the link of it also. So where I have done it. So how, how I have done it. And here are my references. So being an academician, so I have all the references where I have referred this thing, uh, for uh, creating these uh, slides, beautiful slides. And here is me. And thanks for listening. So I am open to questions now. And before that, before concluding, uh, you can see my website nsnam.com. This is one of the website mainly for networking, Internet of Things, whatever I do, I experiment, I experience, I publish it here. And I have a YouTube channel. So in the channel, also I have recorded videos. I have a Twitter handle and my LinkedIn profile. So please ping me for uh, any queries, any uh, information related to IoT.
so you mean uh, uh, mr saurab agnihotri he has asked the question on mqtt so it is something like a telemetry so it is also one of the protocol it is one of the messaging protocol available for iot uh, what i have mentioned here is coap coap so coap have a facility of ip address six addressing but mqtt it is not like it is something like telemetry so uh, one application for this is in uh, european countries they use in cars so there's a company what do they do is they deploy a small chip uh, inside a car uh, that uh, chip works on a mqtt protocol suppose if the car met with an accident where there is no possibility of a router access points wherein i can connect to the car so in that case the chip automatically sends its location to the whereabouts or what place the accident have happened so there they use telemetry so we need not have ip version 6 addressing there so we can simply need the location of the device where the accident have happened for that we use that mqtt so this is also one of the uh, messaging protocol for iot other than uh, coap so coap is mainly for dealing with ipv6 but if there are some places wherein we cannot have ipv6 so in that case we can go for this mqtt uh mr ramu has asked a question on what are the future career prospects on iot in india uh ramu actually iot will have a really a greatest the innovation because what we call earlier days we use microcontroller based applications in the 1980s 70s after that uh, there was no uh, nothing on microcontroller microprocessor based it was simply uh, i mean it's, it's very not very dynamic very statically it grown after the people call embedded systems it becoming very uh, it's a old wine in a new bottle now the same embedded they call it as sensor networks for the past 10 years now they call iot so microcontrollers embedded systems sensor networks now it is internet of things the same kind of technology now we are adding one more one by one according to it so now iot we call it as embedded with sensor networking that what we call so in future everything will be on uh, uh, internet of things so if you go to your mall so for example last month you purchased something on a mall something in a mall so when you go next time automatically when you cross the shop the shop will tell you that sir today there is a discount of 25 percentage you get a sms immediately today you will get 25 percentage on purchasing a product from our shop you can feel that the the 25 percentage discount is only for you because you visited that same shop a month back so this kind of business decisions also they can take through iot so uh, it definitely in india they will have a, a real potential in iot because huge develop uh, developer community is there working on this internet of things oh mehul gupta so not lousy networks uh, it was a spell mistake it's a lousy networks l o s s y so because uh, since it is an iot uh, network so what happens is uh, most of the packets um, actually the reliability is very less because of wireless network the reliability is less not only on the unreliable but also what happens is when uh, collision will be there packet collision when two nodes transmit the data uh, Uh, they will be working on an agreement i transfer for you transfer for something like uh, a duplex kind of communication so during the communication there could be loss of packets so since it is a uh, low rate wireless application there could be huge number of loss of packets that's what we call it as a lossy networks how do we overcome this lossy networks that's why we use a protocol rpl routing protocol for uh, lossy networks that's what not uh, lossy is just a spell mistake sorry it's the lossy networks l o s s y okay uh, somebody have asked on raspberry pi uh, so what the question is i'll read the question here such a long question how ipv6 six low pan configured at sensor level raspberry pi level and application level what are the different tools which language should be used to configure and integrate sensors raspberry pi iot server database and mobile app okay so you want to do a control from your mobile application i understand that so you want to have a control of a mobile app the mobile app should control your raspberry pi device which is deployed elsewhere that's what i think over thing see raspberry pi doesn't have a direct support of 6 low pan but raspberry pi have a support of ipv6 uh maybe what you do is uh, in raspberry pi there is a protocol called blip b l i p uh, b for ball uh, l for long i for india p for pradeep so there is a protocol called blip protocol so this blip protocol uh, you just uh, it could be available as a stack or it could be available as a simple piece of software you install the blip protocol and to the raspberry os and then you can play around so that 
uh, you need not control at all the three levels. You can, since six flow pan is an adaptation layer, it can be configured at the, the between the network and the data link layer. That's it. In the application level, you can have a co-op is fine. As long as IPv6 is there, co-op is co-op will do perfectly fine. And even HTTP also will do that. So I never say HTTP will not do it. HTTP also will do it, but HTTP will occupy uh, more headers. That's the problem with HTTP. But co-op is simply supported by Raspberry Pi uh, based on the blip package, BLIP. Yeah, again the same kind of question, uh, Ms. Namrata Bhagerwal asked, are there any SDKs or APIs available to integrate SixFlowPan and IoT into Android and iOS mobile applications so that smartphones can communicate with the embedded devices directly or remotely? It is possible. Again, in uh, in Android phones, uh, I, I have not heard about it, but in Android, there's an app uh, for this co-op, like a copper plugin for Firefox. In Android, there's a co-op. So what you do is install this app into your uh, Android phone. iOS, I'm not sure about it. In Android, you can install the app. Once you install the app, you can simply access the IPv6 address through your uh, this device. So this device, you have to deploy it elsewhere. And please understand that the device, what you deploy, and the phone, what you use, should be in the same network. Hope you can understand. Same network means, suppose if I use 3G connection, let's say I have an Airtel connection on a, uh, my mobile phone, and I have something else, some broadband Wi-Fi on my uh, device, I could not be able to do. So both of them should be in the same network, I can able to do that. Uh, but uh, in the Raspberry Pi, I, have, I didn't try it uh, try directly, but I have tried on real sensor modes. So maybe in future, I will have a, I have an idea to try it on Arduino on Raspberry Pi. Verify. I'll definitely do it and then keep watching my uh, uh, YouTube channel so that very soon I'll post a video about this. Mm. Maybe I can uh, handle two more questions. Yeah, uh, Preeti Bakale. So she has asked a question on where to use MQTT and where to use Quark. I think I already answered this in the beginning. So MQTT can be used where there is a where there is no chance of accessing IPv6. So there you can use MQTT. If you have a provision of IPv6, then you can use uh, co-op. Because the main the problem with IPv6 is it is uh, not well versed deployed across the country. So in, you can count the number of countries, count the number of corporates, number of uh, industries uses IPv6. Most of us rely on IPv4 only. But very soon IPv6 will come, uh, this local IPv6 so you can deploy your own network in your home. So you have local IPv6 within your home. Only the border router will have the IPv6, which is which you can purchase through uh, the subscribe the ISPs that I want IPv6 address uh, for my home, something like that. So once you go inside the, the router with IPv6 address, then you can control your entire home. But as of now, uh, the IPv6 I don't know whether any ISPs are giving these addresses. Maybe uh, one or two might be there for selling it. If you have the IPv6 with you, then you can play around. If you do not have, then you can obviously go for MQTT. Again, MQTT protocol, uh, it have a support. Uh, Contiki have a greater support of MQTT, as well as RIOT have a greater support of MQTT. But tiny ways again, missing MQTT. Mm. Over there, uh, some uh, Rishwanath Satpadi have asked a question on uh, can you please give me some reference for over the air firmware update, open source project and specification? Uh, I'm not sure about this, uh, but usually when we use OP OTS, what we do is the sensor, they directly supports OTS. So that means uh, there are some softwares available. Uh, using the software, we can directly uh, give it. So main thing is OTA, uh, you, you need not have any open source application. The main, uh, for example, I want to update on a, update my firmware on my sensor device. I am working on a Linux machine, for example. So I can directly contact from my machine to the thing. I can directly contact via the device driver. Only thing is you need to have a device driver. So if you have the device driver, it's well and fine. Uh, oh, Jnana Guru. Yes, yes, Jnana Guru has asked a question on what are the types of sensors? Uh, sir, sensor, there are different uh, sensors. You mean the sensing type you are asking or sensor types you ask? Uh, for example, I have magnetometer. In your mobile phone, you can see the magnetometer. 
uh, yeah, accelerometer and you have, uh, mer I mean, mercurial sensors. So these sensors, automatically your phone have already that. So these kind of sensors I can have in a sensor board, I can do that. And even nowadays we have sensors like uh, chemical sensors also available. So for example, I want to design a robot that pluck the jasmine flower when it is blossomed. I want to, uh, the robot has to pluck it on its own. Now what do they do is, they go, they smell the flower and then they pluck it. Usually the jasmine, the flower jasmine, usually they do that. But if I want to deploy a robo for that, the robo has to sense it, whether what is the smell it is coming, whether it is blossoming or it takes another two days to blossom. So those things will take care. So for that we call it as chemical sensors. So nowadays chemical sensors also transmit the data wirelessly. So rather than sensors, you have to keep on asking about the radios. That means the radio, what kind of radio it uses, the sensor uses. You have a sensor board separate, a radio board separate. Just attach both these things, your sensor will be transmitted via the radio. As simple as that. Uh, there is a last question, Naman Garg. Uh, what is the scope for pressures in IoT? Uh, so you, you are a fresher now. You deploy uh, one or two, a couple of publications in IoT, then you no longer be a fresher. So uh, because that is what the industry is going on. Industry is uh, demanding the IoT applications. So every industry now, they are doing some kind of IoT application either for their business analytics or for their uh, real exploring the potential of IoT. So what you can do is you can um, start from the basic. Uh, maybe since you are a fresher, I, I suggest you that um, just 450 rupees, just uh, not even 10 dollars, less than 10. So around 500 rupees, there is a board called as MSP430. MSP430 by Texas Instruments. So M for master, S for single, P for Pradeep, MSP 430. So that board is coming around just a cost of a pizza. So just 500 rupees. Just start working on it. It can it support so many things. You can more than hundreds of exercises you can able to do on that. All IoT exercises. So after that you start exploring with uh, Intel Galileo, Intel Edison. They are all full-fledged boards with uh, inbuilt sensors available. Yeah. So thanks for your uh, time for all the reasons.